How we got the cure. A whole journey in Who? the 80s with the uh, cure. Uh, <laughs> another album well regarded by critics and fans yes. alike. But before we get into that, uh, in the montage, you heard Love Song, and now you're going to hear a clip from Fascination Street. So yeah, we went with a couple of the singles on this one, but Matt, mm. why don't you go ahead and run the numbers? So Disintegration by The Cure comes in at number four in the 1980s on Best Ever Albums, number two in 1989, number 32 of all time. It is The Cure's highest rated album on Best Ever Albums. It's the highest rated uh, album in Rolling Stones list tonight, coming in at number 116, and The Cure are ranked number 27 of overall artist rankings on Best Ever Albums. So we have covered The Cure many, many times. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Famously, uh, the first time we were supposed to cover one Cure album, but we ended up covering <laughs> two Cure albums Oops. because of a little bit of a snafu with uh, Matt covering it. Um, and then we ran through quite a bit of their uh, catalog in the 1980s. There's going to be some reference points um, to some of those albums as I do a bio. The, the, there is so much material about The Cure that um, synthesizing this into one bio is going to be hard. And I know we had two longer bios this show, so I'll try to do a little bit of a streamlined one. Um, I will say that uh, The Cure, just to give you an overview uh, for those that may not be familiar or were not aware of this, they have sold over 30 million albums worldwide. They've released 13 studio albums, two EPs, and 30 singles. And they are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as of 2019. So they have all of the bona fides there. Um, by the time this album came around, though, the only member of The Cure that started the band that's left is Robert Smith. And mm. the, one of the stories, uh, there are several stories that go with uh, The Cure. Uh, in their journey to this point. One is many, many, many band change member changes, um, and there's going to be some major ones before this album. Another is use of drugs and alcohol is going to come up quite a bit. And then uh, the third thing that is going to come up is going to be sort of the shifting idea of the band creative direction style with Robert Smith. So... Mm. Those are things to keep your uh, mind uh, open to. So another thing I thought was funny was that I did research in about six different areas for this. And a couple say the band was formed in 1978. A couple say 1976. And some reference it 1973 when they played a one-off show. For the purposes of uh, this bio, we're going to start with that one-off show in April of 1973, where uh, the founding members of The Cure, who are Robert Smith on piano, notably I did not say vocals, piano at this point, Michael Mick Dempsey on guitar, Lawrence Lowell Tallhurst, we'll hear about him quite a bit, the Lowell is a nickname and it is like LOL, like laugh out loud, <laughs> icon right there is the name. Uh, Mark Cagano on lead guitar and Alan Hill on bass. So they play one show. Um, they're a band called Obelisk, which reminds me, Josh, I'm not a big video game player of what was it? Uh, the Metroid, uh, the Sega Dreamcast, like, uh, was it Metroid or uh, Gaunt no, Gauntlet Legends, I think was the name of the game. Oh, we oh, yes. find the Obelisk. That's the only time I've ever heard of that. Yeah. So there was stuff like that. So that made me kind of chuckle. After playing that show, though, they just kind of practiced songs by David Bowie, Jimi Hendrix, and Alex Harvey uh, in the period there. And in 1976, while they're at a school called St. Wilfred's Comprehensive School, which is like the most British school name ever, isn't it? Uh, yeah. They formed the band again. At this point, um, they have a lead singer uh, that is not Robert Smith. Um, which I found very interesting. Uh, Alex Harvey is the name of the lead singer. So uh, their band name at this point is Malice. Um, uh, Kagano and Dempsey and Hill are all gone by this point. So now you've got Robert Smith with Lowell Tolhurst still floating around. And you've got um, 
I, I, I apologize. I said Alex Harvey. That's the, the songs they were covering. The um, Martin Creasy is the vocalist. I apologize. So Martin Creasy is the vocalist. Uh, Porl Thompson is on guitar. Um, and then uh, you've got Robert Smith and Lowell Tahar. So it's a four piece at this point. Um, they play three live shows uh, during December 1976. And then Martin Creasy leaves the band. Um, and pretty much at that point, uh, they do another. It's very difficult because the evolution of Robert Smith as the singer does not happen. You'd think it would happen right after that, right? But no, yeah. they instead do a talent competition that they win that gets them a recording contract. So they're another one of these bands that wins a show and gets a recording contract. That seemed like it happened a lot in the 1970s, <laughs> that origin story right there. And it's with a German record label. Ariola Hansa is the name of the label. In uh, May 18, 1977 is when that is extended to them. Uh, at this point, the lead singer, and you'll find this funny, uh, Josh, and there's no relations, name is Peter O'Toole. <laughs> um, he is the vocalist that had taken over for Creasy, but uh, Peter O'Toole leaves the band, and that is uh, after they audition several vocalists. Uh, Robert Smith eventually assumes the role of lead singer. So at this point, it's Dempsey, Smith, Thompson, Tolhurst as the band. Okay, so Smith is back mm -hmm. in the fold at this point. So they continue performing around, and they eventually um, find that the the record label is not super satisfied with their demos and they gave them a song called killing an Arab, which is an awesome song. And somehow that group did not feel that record label did not feel that it warranted <laughs> releasing. So they wanted them to do cover band versions of popular songs. And you can imagine how well that went over with somebody like Robert Smith, who is famously, even at this point, um, possessive of the, uh, cures image. And so they, their uh, contract lapses. Uh, luckily for them, um, it did not lapse very long uh, because uh, some other folks had heard Killing an Arab as well. Most notably, uh, Polydor Records scout Chris Parry, uh, who signed them to his new label Fiction which was a subsidiary of Polydor in September of 1978. And he decides to release the song Killing an Arab in December 1978 for those that are wondering and thinking, whoa, is that something that could be a cancellation? No, it's based on a short story by Albert Camus, which I think at one point, Matt, not to pick on you, but didn't you call him Albert Camus at one point, which I remember <laughs> at some point. Did so I? It's, I, I it's believe the stranger. So. I know that. I read Correct. that book. Yes, that, that is not what Killing an Arab um uh, well, I, actually, I think it is based on the stranger. Come to, to, he did come actually to kill an Arab in that book, yes. Yep, yeah, come to think of it. So uh, the more I think about it, I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. So um, they, as early as 1979, were putting on stickers basically saying this has nothing to do with us saying to kill an Arab. It's about, <laughs> it's a literary reference. But, you know, the, the Robert Smith had other instances and, and he was very sincere by the way about that and it lines up but he had other instances where he'd write literary references that led to controversy down the road do you, do you think we, the we cure gave people the benefit of the doubt too much do you think they had you know too much respect for for they thought people would understand things i think i don't think that they were sort of processing being traditionally popular at this point i think sort of yeah. it, it came even though it didn't come fast and overnight i think that kind of came a little bit faster than it went out uh, there, but um, another thing that's going to be important is they released their debut album, Three Imaginary Boys, in uh, May of 1979. It's kind of wild to think that The Cure start right. in the late 70s. Um, we did not cover that one, um, but it uh, has Boys Don't Cry on it, which is sort of a top tier Cure single. One of probably one of the ones that most folks might know who have mm -hmm. cursory knowledge of The Cure. Um, they're not really experienced in the studio at this point, so they hire Mike Hedges. Uh, as their engineer, and he'd be on other albums as well, but uh, Robert Smith was not happy with his production on that, and he just thought that it was lightweight and a little bit too poppy, and it needed a little bit more substance. So it's also around this time that The Cure opened for Susie and the Banshees. Um, Robert Smith would later join the band as a guitar player. Um, in the band, but at this point they're just doing support, and he definitely credits that with moving them from sort of like a traditional post-punk band into sort of more of an artistic direction um, 
would sort of be what he credited them with and opening his mind a little bit on that. Um, around this time, um, Lowell has begun to drink and Robert Smith has begun to do psychedelic drugs at a higher level. Um, and that sort of peaks uh, with uh, albums we did cover, um, 17 Seconds. I shouldn't say peaks. It, it becomes a piece of um, the songwriting process for 17 Seconds. Uh, and then Faith, 17 Seconds is 1980 and Faith is 1981. Those were the two albums that we were talking about that we covered as a two-part early in the 80s. And then um, Robert Smith sort of imagined them as a three-piece set. So you've got, which actually was very fortuitous for us that we did 17 Seconds and Faith together. We also covered Pornography, which... Uh, not surprisingly, uh, it's going to be important for this album, too, because uh, Robert Smith was not in a good place at that, using lots and lots of drugs. The band described the album as nihilistic, and the whole band sort of was in that area. The record company was not happy with uh, the album because they didn't think there were any singles, which I'd probably agree with. And they actually made them polish the track The Hanging Garden to release as a single, I thought it was funny because the record label said they didn't think it was going to be there, but it ended up being the band's first UK top 10 album, charting at number eight. So it did go through. And uh, this is also where uh, a lot of times at this point, the band is being described as having an anti-image image, which kind of drove Robert Smith to distraction. Um, and he sort of leans into it a little bit because he comes back with the big hair and the smeared lipstick. Um coming on right now so that is how if you're wondering how that origin comes it is from them being criticized for having an anti-image image they kind of went up on the stage with just random clothes that were on they were a little bit goth a little bit just basic right would be the word i would say um that was kind of how they were described um at this point simon gallup leaves the cure and he and robert smith don't talk again for 18 months but then they do eventually make up and robert smith is on um uh, is playing with Susie and the Banshees as their lead guitarist in 1982 and 1983. Um, he's on the album Hyena with them, uh, but he does eventually lead, uh, leave in June 1984 to come back to The Cure. There was some questions as to whether that was going to happen. Um, in fact, a lot of people thought The Cure were uh, broken up. Uh, interestingly, during this time, uh, Lowell Tolhurst has moved over to the keyboards instead of the drums, and they sort of challenge Robert Smith to write a pop song. Uh, and Robert Smith is not enthusiastic about this, but then he decides to go along with it. And he writes the, he writes a song called Let's Go to Bed because he's like, what better way to write a pop song than just about, you know, wanting to fuck, basically. And um, it actually ends up being a minor hit in the UK, uh, number 44. And Robert Smith kind of had like a love-hate uh, relationship with that song, uh, more hate, I'd say, than love. He just couldn't kind of understand it. In some ways, it proves some things that he thought already, but in a bad way, kind of, like about the music listening public. Um, they, of course, discover the synthesizer famous. I shouldn't say discover, but really lean into the synthesizer around this time. This is when they're really, uh, releasing songs like Love Cats and stuff like that, which becomes their first top 10 hit. And they release the album The Top, which is Synthesizers, a psychedelic album. We didn't cover that one, but it's kind of a Robert Smith playing all the instruments type of song. Um, he didn't play the drums. That was a guy named Andy Anderson who played it. Um, and there was a saxophonist that was not him, but he was playing uh, the rest of the stuff. Uh, it was a top 10 hit in the UK, and that is the one that kind of broke them over to the Billboard 200 in the US. It's still only 180 though, so they're still under the radar. Um, at this, at this point, there's all kinds of people being fired. They're bringing people in and they're getting fired left and right. There's a couple different guitarists. There's bassists. There's a producer who comes in as a bassist. He leaves um, because of the stress of the touring. Um, they bring in a, a Cure roadie who comes in to be a bassist for a while. And then eventually Gallup, uh, he cast aside, right, in the non-talk for 18 uh months comes back and he is a member of the band and robert smith is very happy about that so in 85 after all of these shifts and almost breaking up you've got robert smith at uh he's playing both uh the guitar and writing the songs and singing you've got lowell tolhurst he's not on the drums anymore he's now on the, the piano i told you it'd be complicated you've got um uh 
you've got poor old Thompson who's playing, who was playing the saxophone. He's now playing the guitar and the keyboards as well. You've got Gallus back in the fold again as the bassist. Um, so you've got all these different people floating around and they uh, release amazingly with all of that they released head on the door an album that we covered and all <laughs> yeah. of us loved and yeah. that is sort of the album that begins to break them in the u.s they get to number 59 on the charts it's another top 10 album in the uk um they release uh a vhs and laser uh disc called staring at the sea which also becomes a greatest hits title for them and gets put out their songs and then this segues them about a year and a half later into kiss me kiss me kiss me uh which becomes top 10 in uh the uk again it once again is number 35 in the u.s and uh, the most successful Cure single up to that point, Just Like Heaven, was on that album. So you can kind of see it's it's starting to come together for them. They've added in some pop sensibility. Mm -hmm. But this is Robert Smith. And you can imagine that Robert <laughs> Smith has a very conflicted uh, relationship with the idea that all of these really catchy pop songs are sort of moving the image right in another direction where they are a mainstream band and he says i don't want us the worst thing i can think of is us becoming like a stadium rock band um and so um he sort of leading into disintegration decides like i want to take us in a different direction and the direction i want to lean us into is I would like to revisit some of the things that were like <laughs> pornography at this point in terms of like where I was at. He was depressed. He was regularly taking LSD at this point, which I don't think is a surprise when you listen to this album in terms yeah. of his songwriting. And he's basically in his in descriptions I've seen, he's taking the LSD to cope with depression and he feels like I need to make another work that sort of explores this depression. Um, but maybe in a slightly different soundscape uh, than pornography. But he definitely yeah. was was aware of wanting to be more gothic and revisiting a little bit of those three albums at the beginning. He felt like he needed it. He also is about to turn 30, so that's oh a big God. deal. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah and but in his mind you know that's 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 a and like any any round number right you're, yeah. you're thinking of that and so um you know there's a lot of other things that are going on around here a bunch of they were in the world tour they had a riot at a concert in buenos aires when a bunch of people bought counterfeit tickets and were denied entry um to the venue it actually leads to them not playing in argentina again until 2013 um, the band brings in the Psychedelic Furs keyboardist Roger O'Donnell um, to become a sextet, a six-member uh, uh, group um, for this tour. Uh, and at this point, Tolhurst is becoming like pretty much completely unreliable due to alcohol consumption. And he and Robert Smith are friends. Um, they have kind of like a... They definitely have like a big brother, little brother, like one's the alpha, one's not type of dynamic to them a little bit in my reading, but they clearly were friends. And um, leading into this album as they're doing the sessions, the band comes up to Robert Smith and's like, listen, you got to like get rid of Tolhurst or else we're all going to leave the band, which I thought was funny considering how much other members had gone that Robert Smith could easily be like, sure, I'll find <laughs> other people. But in this case, he seems to co-sign off of the idea that, yeah, uh, it's time for Lowell to uh, Tolhurst to go. So he uh, does leave, uh, get kicked out of the band. And um, he pretty much says that while it was really painful for him, he also understood it. He does come back um, for them much later in the, the 2010s uh, to play with them for a little bit, sort of square that circle. Um, he does get full writing credit um, on this album, which I thought was a nice gesture, but they said basically his um, contributions were very minimal due to the drinking along the way. Um, with all of this, this album becomes hugely popular. Um, it is a it has three top ten singles in the UK. It is a top fifteen album in the US. It gets up as high as number twelve, and it actually Fascination Street gets all the way to number one on the modern rock charts, and Love Song gets all the way to number two on the pop charts. So I mean, they are in rarefied uh, uh, company here in terms of their charting along the way. Um, the rest of the band says, though, that even though Robert Smith was trying to 
recreate the vibe and the feel of pornography while he was clearly going through some stuff. The rest of the band was also not in that nihilistic state that in fact, there's things where they said they kind of like almost like uh, leaned into it when he was around but then when they left, they'd joke around and sort of not be serious and stuff when he was gone to allow him kind of to have the vibe on that. Um, there's a lot after this. We're going to cover The Cure, I think, later one time in the 90s. If not, I can kind of postscript it. But that, I'll tie it off there because there's a lot of other stuff. But that's sort of the the uh, run-up heading into this album. Um, interestingly enough, this album was not super critically well-regarded uh, in its time. But, of course, retroactively has not only come to be well regarded but considered to be one of the best albums of the 80s so the yeah. question of course now is is it one of our best albums of the 80s and there's probably no one better to start with with that question than my friend josh yes well i i was i was getting ready for this and no it's not in my it's not my best albums of the 80s i i think i discovered you know listening to this going through this cure journey with you guys that I really like when Robert Smith's not depressed and when head on the door and kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, or kind of, um, what train, you know, what transpires or what's, um, you know, created when, when he's in a better headspace. I, 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 this album is difficult in some ways to talk about because I find it interesting sonically, but I don't like immediately, um, you know, gravitate toward or love it. I was I was surprised that it was like the best selling, you know, album of and their most popular album, um, in in some ways because it is kind. Of, it okay. So first of all, it's like it's super dark again. It's it's um it's kind of gloomy, but the sound is different than it was back on pornography and some of those earlier albums. It's. Well, there's you know, synthesizers. Yeah. That, of course, is the big difference. Yes, yes. Yes. I think I think that works to its advantage in some ways. I think the synths work really well with this. Um, it's kind of got this hypnotic quality, but everything is like really stretched out on this and very, um, you know, kind of. We, we, we always say this word, but this really is kind of like a soundscape of in some form of like whatever Robert Smith's headspace is or or kind of. I don't know, like slow, almost like slowed down pop songs in some ways, slowed out synth, uh, drugged out pop songs. And um, it, it gets away from kind of the concise nature of those previous albums and him kind of incorporating different instruments or different like would you say uh the, melodies the template almost disintegrated josh from like <laughs> yes. the normal idea that's, mm -hmm. that's a good point i mean this album in some ways is more akin to nine inch nails pretty hate machine than than some of the pre the, than the previous two albums of theirs um it's kind of got this droning nature to it um there's there's a lot of uh, i think there's a lot of kind of build on the album itself there's like overlapping sounds and kind of feelings within songs that is interesting like there's chimes that that come out in plain song that then carry over into pictures of you i feel like on prayers for rain and then the follow-up track the same deep waters you there's some kind of like sonic connection between the two that kind of carries over into the next thing if it almost feels like a the second movement to this to a same song or something in some way and i feel like there that kind of overlap happens throughout the album that um that is um that is interesting there is a you know there is oftentimes like a, like a grounding drum beat that carries throughout an entire track like on close down or um uh, uh last dance i think and um, there's not a lot of lyrics also i've i found throughout the album it's it's very much like you know all instrumental for stretches then he comes in with a couple verses and then it's instrumental again um, it's very much like this whole album is very much a mood piece all of the songs are really long you know we're getting like five minute plus songs on most of the tracks i think if not if not more and it's um but that being said it's also kind of a very sumptuous sounding album 
so I did kind of get drawn in at times and I could kind of, I don't know. It was, it was hard for me to get on this album's wavelength or I would get pulled in and then I'd get pulled back out again in some ways. And I wasn't always like vibing with what it was going for. I, um, the songs take their time. Um, the whole album takes its time. It's a long album. The, and the, um, but then when the, like the kind of the big hits on here come in, like I'm back in, like I really like them and I'm, maybe I'm just like a basic bitch or whatever, but like the, the, um, you know, fascination street and love song and pictures of you. Those are all really great songs. And they, it's like, he come, he comes out of it a little bit. It's like more up tempo. They're a bit more popular and that like really works for me again, but then it kind of like gets dragged back into the sea of like despair and, and, um, and, and moodiness. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm like really mixed on this album. I like it in some respects. Um, I don't like it in others. So I'm a really like solid thumbs in the middle on this one. Yeah. So it's, it's funny. You said I me, mean, you're talking, you have to compare this album with pornography because the despair, the sadness, the drama, it's yeah. all there, but this is infinitely more listenable for me. Like this is where, you know, Robert Smith is taking all of those really d depressing thoughts and, you know, places and dark ideas in his mind, but he's putting the music and the production behind it is just way more palatable for me. Um, I agree. And I, That's a good point. It, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 what I'm looking for for the Cure. This is the def this is easily the definitive Cure album for me. I mean, when you talk about all the, like all the terms that probably Robert Smith hates, you know, the goth and the the, the you know the sadness and you know, the mope and all that stuff, and and the drama, it's all here. And everything that you said, Josh, is is right. It's long, like it's drawn out. There's plenty of parts in here where there's just like it's like this instrumental, and you question whether there's going to be lyrics at all. Yeah. And and then like four minutes into the song, he'll start singing, you know, so there's a lot of build up into like what he's about to say and, you know, put you through lyrically. Um, but it, it never gets it never bores me. I, 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 I love the sound of this production. I love the sound of the guitar and the the uh, the synthesizers. It's just so. I, I, I was listening to this earlier this week, and Sherry said, you know, it's it's like he's got this. It's so sad and dark, but it sounds so great and nice like it's just this weird yeah. kind of combination that 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 they're coming up with here i think the the, the track listing is really interesting i think that the first three songs plain song pictures of you and close down which if my math is kind of accurate you're looking at like like 17 minutes worth of songs they're all opening tracks it's like three opening tracks in one you know i mm -hmm. could see each one of these like songs being the ones that opens it it's like man which and it's just i i, I find that interesting i don't know if i've really if we've really covered or if i know many albums that you yeah, could say that about that it's like wow that's like it's not till you get to love song before you're like in a song that's like okay this is not an opening track um but it's just um it's slathered with this just really really great production it's very much the cure sound it's like that traditional kind of like the bass that like whatever you know a feed that they're putting through the monitor to make it make that sound it's just you know it's this epic overall sound that um i i love the ride that it takes you on there i don't yeah. think that there's a dud on this i think that there's times where a song will start in a certain direction and a couple minutes later it adds a different layer to it that keeps me interested so that even though yeah the song might be seven minutes long it's kind of like in some ways well it's two songs in one kind of the way that they're the way that they're doing it so it it so it doesn't there's no moment like we just covered the stone roses and we just did the what was the last track that they did um that was just really long it's like okay i get it right it doesn't need to be this long the, i i don't feel that way with any of these songs even though that the overall sound not just within a song but throughout the album it's got it's got a very similar kind of sound some oral uh temp going for but man they're just throwing in enough intricacies enough things here and there and it's just such a nice 
it, it's it's weird to say this this is a nice sounding record even though it's really dark right it's just again you're really you're melding these two things together that are mean. really yeah. hard to do um and it's a great it's a great great album uh it's it's easily yeah. i think this is i i was looking through the all the um the different full episodes that we've got like normal episodes that we've covered this might be my favorite of the, the three i think we just got three heavy hitters tonight with the with full moon fever the stone roses and this album it's just i think this we're saving the best for last as far as i'm concerned but yeah. um you know uh fascination street great bass line you know like more of a rocking song lullaby is this that was another single i believe and that's kind of like this weird he's kind of doing this whispery kind of thing talking about yeah. spider-man's gonna that's have right. you for dinner and you're just like yeah. this is super creepy but man if it's not engaging and and really and pleasant to listen to so um yeah i it, it pictures of you is just like that song could go on for another seven and a half minutes as far as I'm concerned. I just, I just love the sound of this record. So, yeah, I, I, it's, I'm a big thumbs up. I think that this is where they really shine. Yeah, I mean, my God, this album's freaking incredible. It's just, yeah. it's, I do feel, this is one of those albums that for me, it's like, I, like when, when I ask somebody if they listen to this and if they like it or don't like it, I don't judge them, but like I kind of know how much they lean into my tastes. There's certain albums like that, right, where like I, it's like a feeling out point for me to some degree because I I'm different than you guys in that actually some of the stuff, I it's not that I don't like it, but dark cure is what I think makes the cure, the cure. And I think famously in our mm -hmm. pornography album, I think yeah. that's an incredible album. And I know you guys, it was just, it was unattainable for you guys with the, the, um, you know, sometimes you'll hear this album. I think it's very reductive, but you'll hear this called like an accessible pornography. Like, I don't think it is. I think they do different things. I get the idea that they're both dark, but The Cure isn't just dark on two albums. They're gothic romantic at minimal on most albums. The only thing I don't love about this album, even though Love Song's a perfectly fine song, it doesn't fit on this album. It's the only like yes, weird thing on it. And I'm just like, why? And I'm yeah. sure, like, probably for you, Josh, it's like, ah, Refuge. For me, it's yeah. kind of like, why is this here? Like yeah. it does, it's the one song that doesn't fit because vibe wise, it just isn't a fit. And then it's funny because it's if you just I listened to this album one time of the three that I listened to it where I just didn't listen to that in it, and it just is so much more coherent without it there because it's sort of like you guys both didn't mention this. another thing i want to say this is like an incredible headphones album it's like a just a top tier s tier headphones album um this is definitely an album where it's like i'll tell you what i'm gonna put this on and i'm gonna be nothing to the world for 40 some odd minutes because what i want to do is kind of like fold into this i can't imagine listening to this album doing something else it's just an album that completely for me demands that you fall the enter it yeah which i think is kind of what he was going if someone doesn't really listen to music that way or can't i do think you're going to not get all of what it is because it sort of commands you to put headphones on to some degree and listen to it now with that being said it was funny i was visiting um my folks a couple days ago and my dad as much as he knows the cure probably knows you know the the pop hits right? right and i was listening to this and you know i had it on uh, i said hey you don't mind if i i listen to an album that's here he's like yeah yeah he was cooking something for fourth of july and uh, about three songs in he came in and around the um prayers for rain same deep water as you disintegration yeah. run and by disintegration my dad's like this is a really good album he's mm -hmm. like this is dark but like exactly what sherry said matt it's like this is dark but very romantic dark like uh and i said yeah they're, they're a great band he goes yeah I, I only know them as a pop band but they did this stuff too i said oh yeah they did this stuff too he goes i think i like this as much as i like the other stuff so it even caught my my dad's ear on a non-headphone type scenario mm -hmm. but the production's incredible on this. The bass lines all over this album are incredible. I know what you're saying, Josh. There is like a, if you just isolated the drums on this, it might be jarring because it's pretty much that thing where it's just, tsh, 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 just almost like an industrial sound of yeah. the drum, just hitting and penetrating through. And then after a while, uh, I just, I'm not going to say I tune it out, but uh, my brain wraps around its point in the song and, and the drums the drums are not what the songs are about here uh it's they exist to kind of uh it's not keeping the time but they exist to provide a very specific 
function in the songs but the songs are really about robert smith's voice the atmospheric layered guitars the synthesizers um the bass lines which are always up front like all good cure songs are the bass lines are near the front um and uh lyrically it's back to robert smith writing you know hellscape dream songs you know you mentioned the spider-man it doesn't have anything to do with spider-man marvel spider-man this is right. like a man spider right like type <laughs> right. deal so robert's just thought like oh let me just throw a spider-man reference it's so that if you hear that right know that it's basically the idea of like a spider-man character is eating, yeah, like eating you right you. yeah yeah Yes, that is the idea behind that. And that's the vibe. And it might not be for everybody, but I'll, I'll tell you, um, one of the things The Cure does remarkably well is they, they make the dark palatable, which is yeah. an mm -hmm. element to, to, we've talked about it a lot, but, you know, the, the romantic undertone of what I feel most goth is. Um, this is one of the best albums of the 80s. Uh, unlike the Stone Roses album where I'm like, oh, too. I'm like, no, no, this is absolutely uh, one of the best albums of the 80s. And this album also, my love of it way predates ever reading anything in the press about this. I mean, I was given this album when I was 11 years old and I listened to it on uh, like Walkman headphones. Even back then, I'm like, this is an incredible album. Um, and I think my second thing was sort of, I li other thing that happened was I did I listened to this as an album, so I don't process like Fascination Street and Lullaby and Pictures of You as singles necessarily. I process them as tracks on this album. So, and I think that might be a little bit different from how you guys process the Cure, because I know Matt said he kind of came to them by the greatest hits, and Josh, you're kind of coming with knowledge of that as well. But to me, that's why Love Song stands out so much because it's like, well, this is. This is like from the earlier two albums, right? Or greatest hits type deal or a single, right? Mm -hmm. um, it just, it, it juts out on this. Uh, once again, not to knock it, um, but there's a reason that's the song that like 311 covered, right? Like, yeah. let's just put it that way. So, <laughs> um, I, I mean, to be fair, I didn't, I don't associate, I don't know the cure well enough to associate this with like just singles i don't think I. oh gotcha what okay album they were on so. so you didn't hear like pictures of you or lullaby and say oh those are cure singles no, no. okay in gotcha. fact i'm not even sure i heard lullaby before um mm. as, as a single so um yeah i think what you're saying though john i think it is it does make the dark palatable i think that's kind of like a really great descriptor of this album and there is a romanticism to it i agree with that and I think, I mean, I did listen to it on headphones, but I was doing other things too. So I, I agree. I think it, it totally fits like the framework of, of sinking into this and like getting pulled in. I think there is, like I said, there is a hypnotic, um, part, part of this album. And I can totally get, if you're on that wavelength, like why this works so well. I mean, both of you said that. So, um, there's just yeah. certain albums that just, they don't even need to demand my brain. They just get it. Yeah. right or and that's this is an album i would guess matt probably that might be similar to you yeah no this yeah. was um mm -hmm. i i again yeah like you said i knew the cure through the singles that i got actually a friend of mine in college first time i heard pictures of you and a number of these songs I, before i got that that greatest hits album a friend of mine made me a, a mixtape of cure songs so that's that's how i started i was like really the because i always like growing up this was like my you know judging a book by its cover thing but watching the video for love song i'm like who's this guy <laughs> yeah <laughs> like the video you know totally like in my you know you know 10 year old brain just being like i don't like this and just any more hair metal or whatever but like um so but when i did like listen to this record because i at some point i heard oh, oh this is this is considered the quintessential cure album and i and i did listen to it and i was yeah i was just going oh man this is this is one of those albums that just like it's, it was easy for me to get into i liked the fact that the songs were long i liked the fact that it it just kept me engaged and so it wasn't this was not a hard listen you know either this week or the first I, time i ever i heard will it. say it this easy, though you know. i think disintegration is the quintessential cure album for people that the cure are not a top 10 band for them because i know a lot of people who the cure are a top 10 band for them and i don't know if any of them would say disintegration definitively is the, oh, interesting. the, the definitive uh, is that cure. pornography I mean, then some if that's it some like even earlier than that some would say head on the door merges all of the things together best like the pop i mean it's not that they don't like disintegration i just think especially if 
if the synths part of it takes away from some of what you don't like or, yeah. or that you liked about the early cure like i like there is one song on here that sort of brought me all the way back to pornography and that's last dance which feels like it could be a song on pornography and it is stark it's a dark dark song sonically it's also an awesome song um i wanted to point that one out and close down is another song i love your description matt that there's three opening songs on this album that's a perfect way to put it because it is they all like have this crashing cascading song one mm-hmm. like epicness to them uh, and that, I think that's also why that it's like, okay, maybe that's what they're going for on this. And then you get Love Song, which has a, you know, very identifiable bass line, but you immediately like, okay, this is a pop song. Um, maybe they're going in a different direction and they don't. It's just that song, right? But like, um, yeah. So I, when you yeah. said that, I was like, oh, that's a great way to put it. That's a great description. But yeah, this will yeah. be, I don't know where this will be in my final. I, I have my rankings and stuff, but I mean... This will be showing up in my top ten. It's just where. But I, I think John, going back to what you said earlier, like I actually think I think a, this being a, a a more listenable pornography, or I forget the term that you used, but like I, I don't I don't know if accessible. I would say that's accessible. I don't know if I would say that's reductive. I think that that's actually pretty spot on because that's one of the reasons why like, I, the reason I didn't like pornography wasn't because it was dark. It was because of just the music was it was dark Fair. but it was done in a heavy like that's the word that that the best way for me to describe that it was just heavy not heavy metal but heavy and just man i need to i i, I need a rest after that i i need to like clean it's, myself I mean, like listening to this record is almost the opposite of it it's heavy it's it's it can be just as heavy but it, but but melodically it's kind of it's light in a weird. It's such a weird dichotomy that's happening in this record. Yeah. That's one of the reasons it's the I like it so much. synthesizers, guys. I keep yeah. saying that that the synthesizers and and you guys have liked synth rock probably even more than I have throughout the eighties, right? And so mm-hmm. it it makes a lot of sense yeah. that the synths are the X factor for you guys because let's be honest, I don't like everything that's assaultive in tone. Like I didn't love the public <laughs> image limited stuff, but you guys really don't like almost any music in that lane, right? Where I like a lot of music that I would call, you know, openly confrontational. It has to be, yeah, it has to, Mm -hmm. it has to have something at least else. It it can't be just confrontational in and of itself. It's got to have something else for me to get onto. Well, I would say even just if it has something else, if it's confrontational, I find Matt, that it can kind of zap, zap that away for you sometimes. And I know in Josh's case, it's just a sound that just doesn't work for him historically potentially so, i'd have to think i'd have to it depends on the record but i pot- potentially yeah um, well I, early sonic youth albums because what happened is in daydream nation they added more oh melody God. and in the first yes. couple they didn't and there yeah you go. give me some that's melody the, right yeah, yeah that's all i ask is for some melody. and that's, that's what right. the, that's what the cure i mean there were melodies on earlier cure albums it's just they yes. were just bashed over with just direct assault <laughs> on yeah. you sonically and uh, this is like there's melodies on my bloody valentine right like yep. and stuff like that but mm-hmm. yeah yeah i probably would say this is my favorite cure album that we've covered I, I i like the head on the door a lot of too that's probably number two i would say um actually i thought this was a double album i was like man this is a long freaking album but i'm looking here and apparently there was a couple of tracks like looks like homesick and last dance were initially bonus songs so they weren't on the u.s copies i guess when they those came out but they were later added and made a double album or made a, but it's not like a double album in the traditional sense it's just like they added those songs on and they were like we need a little bit more space so it's expanded They're definitely to two, two of the more de- depressing songs on the album yeah. too, those two they stand out for yeah. being this amongst the starkest songs on the album so it's interesting they are the two add-ons yeah mm-hmm but. That could be Robert Smith going like, this is still too poppy for me. I need a little <laughs> bit more morose. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think we are covering them. I, I just was looking at the nineties here. We and may I not. I think wish is the last one that's considered to be sort of in the, the cure albums where they were still considered to be, you know, like playing in the mainstream, so to speak after that kind of, yeah. uh, well, they have wish and then, they have a 91 album in treat which i never hear about i guess uh I they guess have an album called show oh wait that's from 2000 yeah it's uh, there's it's really i think wish is the last one that would be something in which they were still sort of considered to be 
like getting MTV airplay, radio airplay, and stuff like that. So that's not to say there's not stuff later, but in terms of you know greatest hits stuff and where the stuff comes from, right? Wild mood gonna... swings from 1996. Mm -hmm. it, but if yeah. you were to look at the track list on that, you're not really seeing anything that. Um, no. I'm trying to even remember what the. I don't even think there's a solo uh, single on that one. If I remember. I just the album so Friday, cover Friday looks Friday Love is on Wish. Right. No, that's no on... Wish is still yeah. mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. We, and, and Friday on Love is that one of those Buzz songs clip. that I'm Perfect. sure you guys will love. Yes. And oh, I yeah. vine yeah, on it, but oh. it's like, yeah. No, mm. Mint Car. Mint Car is on. Um, oh, okay. Yep. Is on that. Is on Wild Mood Swings. So that's a, that's okay. a good song. Josh, you'd like that song. That's more of the Friday I'm in Love mm. era, you know, Vintage Smiths. But yeah, we're the only the next thing we're covering for the Smiths is, or that's Smiths, excuse me, The Cure is. Um, we're doing Friday I'm in Love as a buzz clip. Yeah, so, buzz yeah. Clip. Which is funny because Robert Smith and Morrissey famously hate each other. So that's just something yeah. else that you could do. Well, they always kind of like, you know, that's the kind of like in some discussions that I've, you know, come across. It's like that people talk about them in the same vein, like these, you know, these, the, the, but they weren't, they're similar, but they're not really at all. It's, you know, it's kind of like Although, they kind of get talked about in the same yeah. conversation. They do share one topic in which they both are uniform on and that they both hate the monarchy yeah like about... <laughs> if you hear that they are very outspoken about how much they hate everything about the monarchy so I they also, do share that i also love it when they got inducted the cure got inducted to the rock and roll hall of fame where the the woman was interviewing robert smith on the red carpet she's like are you really ex are you as excited as i am to be to be to be inducted he goes apparently not <laughs> like deadpan <laughs> <laughs> like I said, there's a shared sense of humor. There. It's, a, it's like you hate the people that are most like you to some degree. So, yeah. 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 But uh, so, I'm going to kind of leave it leave it there. Um, yeah. The Cure continue to play live to this day. Yeah, uh, yeah it's funny. They just you, you, I was going to say that they you were saying how they didn't want to be like a big – he didn't want them to be a big you know, arena band. At a, I oh, read he some... mentions that because they go on a big stadium tour directly after this album. He's like, yeah. we've basically become everything that I've not – But then they, just, they just finished a tour that – like one of the biggest of the year. It's like, you know, sales wise. And they were selling out like crazy for this most recent yeah. tour that they were just and on. And they were so. fighting Ticketmaster for raising prices. Right. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So good on them for that. Yeah. yeah. No, he was very aware of the fact that they, after this album where he was trying to get back to the basics, they ended up playing stadiums in the U S and the yeah. UK. And once again, I think he had like a love hate relationship with that. Cause he wanted his music to be heard, but you know, yeah. he was, He's self-aware. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. The, you know, this is our last album that we cover for the '80s, and we started out with Bauhaus. So goth rock on both ends. That's right. We bookend book book the bout. Right. Good, good, good <laughs> call back there, Josh. Yeah. So, definitely, I I do agree. I think my final thought on this is that this probably is like the best or one of the best goth rock albums that we've listened to. Um, I totally kind of get like you know, what it's going for and kind of, I know got Robert Smith didn't like the goth rock label and a lot of the bands didn't, um, that were considered goth rock, but I feel like this captures some of those, those, those feelings. And, and, uh, well, I think aesthetic. it was less that he dislike didn't dislike goth rock is he really hated that. No, no image thing that they said. Mm -hmm. They were just sort of this plain band because he thought there was sort of an artistic underpinning. And I think he was aware that, you know you can't help but be aware when the references that you're pulling right. right from it so i don't think it was necessarily goth as much as like what it came to be seen as as sort mm -hmm. of like schlocky goth right like if it yeah. had been like a harder goth like he might have embraced it a little bit more yeah yeah and i see what you're saying too there's probably plenty of like diehard cure fans that would not would not say that this is their they, they might even say this is like there's like four or five albums that are better than this right but i think that one of the things that makes an album great is the fact that like you can take kind of more of a niche genre like like a goth rock kind of the mopey kind of like dark you know genre that the cure have and then universalize still hang on to that quality and that that essence of who you are as a band but then universalize it to like people that wouldn't like it ordinarily and and have it just be this kind of mass appeal i think i think that sometimes is a secret sauce for a great album is to take that unique sound and to make it more you know palatable for everybody but still hold on to it and that's that's yeah. what this record does and that's probably why it's on so many lists because a lot of people can be like yeah that's a great album even if even if you don't really like the cure what they were the, like the, the the true essence of the cure this is going to be this is going to be an album that you might actually like so um there's something yeah. to be said for that 
And one last postscript. Um, Robert Smith was aware of how jarring Love Song was on there, and it wasn't by accident. That was a wedding gift for his fiance at the time, Mary mm-hmm. Poole, who he had been with from forever. And he said, it was an open show of emotion. It's not trying to be clever. It's taken me 10 years to reach the point when I feel comfortable singing a very straightforward love song. He says, that one song, I think, makes many people think twice. If that song wasn't on the record, it would be very easy to dismiss the album as having a certain consistent mood. But throwing that one in sort of upsets people a bit because they think that doesn't fit. And guess what, Robert? That was what I thought when I heard it, too. So, mm-hmm. But A, I'm okay with that. And B, it's it's the shortest song. It's not, it's not even three and a half minutes long. So even if yeah. you don't like it, you could. it's going to be over pretty quickly compared to everything else. But um, but yeah, it's, it is, it's like that. It, it is that thing that stands out a little bit, um, but it's still a good song. If you're going to have something stand out and be a little different, make it might as well make it a good song. Mm-hmm. So, 